so ein Pressure treffen, wenn es um Katranis geht today. So wenn es so auf Pages geht wie an der AT, der UCL, London, die uns dann Post von Chapman University and now Lorenzo is in Berlin, in Berlin. And we'll hear about non-classicality of the US car. Thanks a lot, Marco, for the nice introduction. And uh, of course, let me start by saying I'm very happy to be here. It's, uh, I think it's a very special place, in particular at this time, you know, like with all the Nobel Prize and stuff, I think there is a very good atmosphere. I feel privileged somehow to have this opportunity. So let me thank uh, Tom and Marcus for allowing me to present this work. Uh, so I'm going to talk about quantum interference phenomena. And I'm going to talk about which aspects of those phenomena are classical and non-classical. I'm going to be very precise what I mean by that. So uh, let me say that this uh, presentation is going to be based on uh, three works. So the first one is this one, was in collaboration with uh, Matt Liefer, David Schmidt, and Rob Speckens. And then there is another one in the archive, and one that is going to come up soon, which is also in collaboration with the same authors and Giovanni Scala. So the way I decided to give this presentation is to divide it in, in two parts. It's going to be more or less 20 minutes each. And uh, so the first part is about uh, describing the basic phenomenology of interference that usually people appeal to in saying that contains, uh, you know, some in inherent mystery. It's showing that actually it doesn't pose a challenge to the classical worldview. And then the second part instead is going to be about considering more nuanced aspects of the phenomenology of interference and showing actually that those constitute some true non-classicality. Okay, so these are the two parts. Let us start with the first. So the title of the first is basically also the same title of this paper, which is why interference phenomena do not capture the essence of quantum theory. The outline of this part is the following. So I'm going to start with uh, just the motivation behind this. Then I'm going to describe the phenomenology of quantum interference that is traditionally regarded as problematic, meaning those aspects of the phenomenology that usually are associated with interpretational claims that, that, that depict uh, interference as the essence of quantum theory as uh, truly mysterious. And I'm going to do that in the setup of Max Zander interferometers that I guess uh, many people are familiar with. Then I'm going to introduce the toy field theory, which is an alternative theory to quantum theory that uh, reproduces the same phenomenology, this traditional regarded as problematic phenomenology, but explicitly rejects all these claims. Okay. Good, so let me start. Motivation. You know, the motivation behind this kind of works is always to try to understand what is, uh, you know, really uh, non-classical about quantum theory, what really defies any uh, classical explanation. And in particular here I focus on quantum interference because that's usually one of those aspects that people would say, oh, this really captures, you know, the essence of quantum theory. And in particular I really want to start with this quote from Feynman in uh, introducing the two slit experiment in quantum theory in his famous lectures of physics, where he says that it is a phenomenon which is impossible, absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way. It contains the only mystery. In telling you how it works, we will have told you about the basic peculiarities of all quantum mechanics. I think this is one of the most quoted um, uh, you know, quotes from, from Feynman. And uh, you can see uh, this first part of the talk somehow as disputing this kind of claims, okay? Disputing the claims that the basic phenomenology of quantum interference resists explanation uh, within the classical worldview. But you see, like really, the first question we should ask ourselves is, so what is really considered to be mysterious about quantum interference? So now I'm going to try to do that by focusing on the simple setup of Max Zander interferometers, okay? So uh, I'm going to consider just two configurations. The first one is where I say we have a Max Zander interferometer with a phase shifter in place. So basically what happens is the following. So you have a photon that impinges a 50-50 beam splitter. Then two paths originate. Uh, we imagine that we can have a zero or pi phase shifter in the right arm. Then these are just two mirrors. Nothing really happens. Then we have a second 50-50 beam splitter where the two paths are combined, and then we have the two output ports that detect uh, you know, where the photon goes. Let me stress again that I only consider this scenario with 50-50 beam splitter and zero pi phase shifter, because it's going to be enough to reproduce the phenomenology that is traditionally regarded as problematic about quantum interference. We don't need to consider more complex scenarios. Okay? The other, and also let me say the LNR, as you imagine, means left and right. 
The other configuration I consider is that is the one where instead of the phase shifter, I consider a which way detector, so it just detects whether the photon uh, went there or not. Okay, so these two uh, configurations. Now let me provide just the quantum mechanical description of these two. In particular, I'm gonna consider what is called the second quantized description, where we associate uh, two-dimensional Hilbert space to both modes, left and right mode, and we consider what is called the Fox space formalism. So basically, we associate to the initial state, the state one zero, it just says that the left mode is occupied and the right mode is not, okay? So in this picture, the beam splitter is associated with a unitary that entangles these two modes. In particular, it leads us to the uh, uh, state which is the, uh, the two modes are anticorrelated. Then let us assume the first case where the phase shifter is zero, so nothing really happens. We are in the same state. We go to the second beam splitter, we apply the unitary again, and we obtain the state one zero. So this just means that every time we run this experiment, the left port is gonna fire, okay? Let us consider the case where we place a pi phase shifter. In this case, same story at the beginning. Now we represent the action of this pi phase shifter just as a Pauli Z on the right mode. What it does, it just flips the, the, the local phase and so also the relative phase. So it maps the, to this uh, correlated entangled state. We apply the unitary again of the beam splitter and we obtain zero one, which means that every time we run this experiment, the right output port is gonna fire, okay? So you see, we have seen these two scenarios where every time we have a maximum of uh, probability of detection in one port and a minimum on the other. And this really represents an interference pattern. It's like in the two-slit experiment, if you send a water wave and you just uh, see interference at the end. The only difference is that here, like the screen is just made of these two locations instead of a continuous of locations, okay? So this really represents what is called a wave-like behavior, okay? Like an interference uh, pattern. Let us consider the case where we, instead we have a which way detector, okay? So at the beginning, same story. Now let us assume that uh, we post-select on the case where the which way detector says that uh, there is no detection there, okay? So we just apply the standard measurement update rule and we obtain the state one zero, it just says that after this we didn't detect anything here, so uh, we're gonna have the left mode to be occupied and the right is not. We apply again the 50-50 beam splitter. What we obtain this time is this uh, entangled state. What it means is that if now we run the experiment many times, we're gonna obtain that 50% of the time we have the left port firing, 50% the right port firing. So you see this time we have a uniform distribution over the two locations, which is like a particle-like behavior, right? It's like in the, when you do the two-slit experiment, you just see the bell shape at the end. So you see, we have seen that uh, this is how, uh, in quantum mechanics, we describe this phenomenology, okay? What we experience in the lab if we do these two configurations of the max under interferometer. I wanna say that this is the phenomenology about quantum interference that is traditionally regarded as problematic, uh, acronym is TRAP, phenomenology, and uh, this uh, kind of phenomenology, why is traditional regard is problematic? Because it's usually associated with some interpretational claims that depict interference as something, uh, you know, inherently mysterious. Let us see these claims, what they are. So the first one is the one I already alluded to, is this uh, wave particle complementarity. So it seems that the quantum system is some, you know, sometimes a wave, sometimes a particle, without the possibility of a unifying description of the two. And you know, like waves and particle in classical physics are two very different things, right? So it really seems to be a feature that defies any classical explanation. Then we have seen that it seems that it is the observer that decides whether the quantum system is a particle or is a wave, depending on whether uh, she or he uh, uh, decides to put a which way detector or not. So this also uh, really seems a bit uh, mysterious, observer dependence of reality. Finally, maybe a bit more subtle, it seems that it's impossible to provide a causal explanation of what's going on, which is local. Think, for example, the case where we have the photon, which is on the left uh, path before the, the second 50-50 beam splitter, then it seems like that the photon must know whether there is a detector or not on the other arm. Because if there is no detector there, then the photon is always gonna output on the left port. But if there is a detector, then sometimes it can output on the right port. So it really seems that there must be some no local causal influence from one arm to the other. Some people that didn't like the, this inherent non-locality, 
they provide other like uh, radical explanations, like the retrocausality retro from the uh, pores back to the photon, or like uh, you cannot talk about the existence of the past until it's measured in the present, like these radical explanations. I put them all here in this category to say that it seems that it's impossible to have an explanation in terms of local causes, okay? So, so far, what I did was just to describe this trap phenomenology of quantum interference and say what are the interpretational claims associated with it. Wave particle complementarity, observer dependence of reality, failure of explanation in terms of local causes. Okay? So now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, introduce this uh, alternative theory to quantum theory that we call the toy field theory that uh, reproduces this trap phenomenology as just showed, but explicitly rejects all these claims, okay? So let me say that I don't have time to explain all the toy field theory, which is just a version of speck and soy theory. In details, you can look at the paper. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna provide, uh, let's say, what is the theory construction scheme to define it. And then I'm gonna also, um, you know, just use the part of the theory that I need to reproduce the uh, phenomenology, okay? So the theory construction scheme, so what does it mean? So the toy field theory is an example of a classical statistical theory with epistemic restriction. What does it mean? It means that uh, to define it, we need to specify uh, you know, three uh, things. So the first one is what is the underlying classical physical theory, which means we need to specify what is like the, the kinematics and the dynamics of our theory. So in particular, the kinematics, we need to specify what are the systems and the properties we are talking about. In particular, in the toy field theory, the systems are two field modes, the left and right modes. And then the properties that they have, each one is an occupation number and a phase. And they are specified at all times, okay? We denote them with n and phi, okay, for left and right mode. And we assume that they can only take values zero or one. Of course, we also demand that the sum of the occupation number is one, because we want to say that at every time only one of the two modes is occupied, okay? So these are the systems and the properties. The dynamics, uh, we're going to see that in action in a bit, but it's going to be explicitly uh, deterministic and local. And if you want, like, you know, this specification is like uh, when you specify classical Hamiltonian mechanics, right? You specify that the state space is the phase space and the uh, physical properties are position and momentum, and then, uh, you know, the dynamics is just the Hamiltonian equations. So it's, it's really classical theory, okay? Then what we want to do is we want to say that, you know, maybe uh, you have some uncertainty about what are the properties of the system. So you want to be able to say that uh, you might have some probability distributions over the physical state that describes your uncertainty about them, okay? So what we are going to consider is also the statistical theory associated with this classical physical theory. This is like when you develop Liouville mechanics from uh, classical Hamiltonian mechanics. So far, everything is really just like classical theory. The extra ingredient we consider here is this epistemic restriction. So you assume that among all these possible probability distributions that you consider, only some of them are allowed, okay? So it's called epistemic restriction because if you interpret probabilities as, you know, state of knowledge, then this is really a restriction on what an agent can know about the reality, about the physical properties, okay? In particular, in the toy field theory, the epistemic restriction for one mode says that no agent can have knowledge about more than one property. So, for example, if you know the occupation number, you are completely ignorant about the phase, or vice versa, or you can know the sum of occupation number and phase and completely ignorant about the rest. And then this epistemic restriction also extends to when you have two uh, systems and so on, but uh, I, I'm going to just show it how it works in action without uh, giving the details about it. So the toy field theory is... Uh, Classical statistical theory over field modes with an epistemic restriction, okay? So now let us see this, how, uh, how it reproduces the, uh, you know, max ender interferometer in the two configurations. So the way I wanted to describe it is the following. So on the left side, I want to say, I want to recall how quantum theory describes it, and on the right side, how the toy field theory describes it. But don't be confused, this doesn't mean that the toy field theory is a model of quantum theory. It's just an alternative theory. It would exist even if quantum theory didn't, okay? So you remember, at the beginning, the initial state is the state 1, 0, right? So in the toy field theory, this corresponds to the states of knowledge where we know that the occupation number of left mode is 1, we know that the right mode occupation number is 0, and so we are completely ignorant about the phases because of the epistemic restriction. Then we can also model the uh, beam splitter. You remember, in quantum theory, it was this unitary. In the toy field theory, it just corresponds to the swap rule. So it just says that the value of the occupation number of left mode gets swapped 
with the value of the relative phase, okay? While all the other um, uh, variables remain constant. So let us see this in action. Uh, you remember this was the first stage of the uh, max ender interferometer. In the toy field theory, this corresponds to say that, oh, at the beginning we know that uh, left mode is occupied, right is not, and completely ignore about the rest. We apply the swap rule, so the value of the uh, occupation number of left mode becomes the value of the relative phase. Okay? And so we end up in the state where we know the, that the phases are anti-correlated of the two modes, but we are completely ignorant about the individual values of occupation number and phases. Okay? So now, just to soften the notation, let me call, every time that we call this state of knowledge as a state of knowledge where we know that occupation number of left is one, and this one where we know that the relative phase is one. Let me also say that here the relative phase is a plus because we are in arithmetic modulo two, so pluses and, and differences are the same. Good, so let us now uh, reproduce the phenomenology of the max ender interferometer in the first configuration. So you remember where we had a zero phase shifter in place. So as I said, the, the initial uh, stage is the following. We start that we know that the left mode is occupied. Swap rule, this value becomes the value of the relative phase. We know that the modes are anti-correlated. Zero phase shifter, so nothing happens. We still have the same state. We apply again the swap rule in correspondence of, of the second beam splitter. What we obtain is that we know that the left mode is occupied. So it means that every time we run this experiment, the toy field theory predicts that the left output put port is always going to fire, which is exactly what we had before, right? So now let us consider, so wave-like behavior. Now let us consider the case where we place a pi phase shifter, okay? So beginning, same story. Uh, as you can imagine, the action of the pi phase shifter uh, for the, uh, you know, in, in the right uh, mode, what it does, it just flips the value of the local phase of the right mode, okay? So as a consequence, also the value of the relative phase get flipped, right? And so uh, what happens after this action is just we know that the modes now are correlated instead of being anti-correlated. We apply the swap rule again, and what you obtain is that we know that the left uh, port is not gonna fire. So it means that every time we run this experiment, it's the right port that is gonna fire, okay? So again, we have reproduced the case of uh, wave-like behavior that we had before. Now let us see the case where we place a which way detector, right? In order to address this case, I need first to tell you what is the measurement update rule in the toy field theory. Let us read it together. Uh, it says that after a measurement of the occupation number of a mode, one assigns zero probability to the physical states that are inconsistent with the outcome of the measurement. Furthermore, the discrete phase of the mode is randomized. With probability a half is left unchanged, with probability a half is flipped. So this may sound a bit abstract, abstract, but all what it says is that we have a learning step in this measurement update rule where we get the knowledge of what is the value of the occupation number in this case, but because we need to satisfy the epistemic restriction, then, then we need to have a, another step of disturbance. Um, yes, it worked perfectly. Great. It was all planned. Uh, yeah, so we need to satisfy epistemic restriction, so we also need to have a disturbance step. Otherwise, we would know too much, right? If we get the knowledge of the occupation number and uh, we already knew the knowledge of the phase, then we would know the, the physical state. But that's not allowed in the toy theory. So we also need this disturbance step. And you can imagine this disturbance that half of the times the value of the phase remains the same, and half of the times it's flipped, okay? You can picture this randomization uh, in this way. Let us see this in action, okay? So you remember this was the configuration, the beginning, same story as before. Now we assume that we are in the case where we post-select that on the measurement of the occupation number or right mode, we assume that we, there is no detection, okay? So this means that we learn that the value of nr is zero. But as I said before, this implies that we need to randomize the phase, right? So the state of knowledge after this is a state of knowledge where we know the occupation number of mod r is zero, so the occupation number of mod l is one, and we are completely ignorant about the local phases, okay? So after this, we apply the swap rule as usual. This value becomes the value of the uh, relative phase. So this means that we are completely ignorant about the occupation number. So this means that when we run this uh, experiment many times, half of the times we're gonna see the left port firing, half of the times we're gonna see the right port firing. 
So again, we have reproduced also this case, the case of particle-like behavior. And let me summarize literally in two sentences how the toy field theory reproduces these two cases. So if you realize the output of the max under interferometer, so which port fires, depends on what is the value of the relative phase before the second 50-50 beam splitter. It's always like that. So in the case of whale-like behavior in the toy field theory, this value is always fixed because it just, just comes from the swap rule of the initial state. And therefore also which uh, output port is going to fire is fixed. But in the case of particle-like behavior where we have this randomization of the occupation number, oh sorry, of the phase of the right mode, then this implies also randomization of the relative phase and therefore also the fact that we don't know uh, which output port is going to fire. Okay? So it's uh, really as simple as that. And I think that, uh, so the interesting part is that uh, the way it reproduces this phenomenology is also in a way that explicitly rejects all the claims, the interpretational claims that we listed before. Let us see them one by one. So wave particle complementarity, you remember this fact that uh, the quantum system is this kind of dualistic entity, you know, toggling between being a wave or a particle. This is not the case because here the systems are explicitly two field modes. It's always that, the entity. And they have a wave-like property, which is the phase, and a particle-like property, which is the occupation number. But the variability concerns what is known about them, not about the, the reality. OK? Observer dependence on reality. Um, yeah, so um, it seemed like that it was the observer that could you know, decide if the quantum system was a wave or was a particle. But here instead what uh, the observer decides what uh, she or he wants to know about the, uh, these two properties, uh, phase or occupation number. So there is no uh, you know, observer dependence of reality. Finally, uh, we had this uh, failure of explanation in terms of local causes. And uh, here, I mean, all the dynamic is, is explicitly local. And in particular, you remember the problematic case were, was when you place a which way detector. But here the story is like, uh, it's quite simple. When you place a which way detector, you have this randomization. So half of the time you say the local phase remains the same. Half of the times is flipped. This information propagates to the second beam splitter. And then it tells us what is the relative phase and what uh, output port is going to fire. So you see what was thought to be no local causal influence. Here is just an update of knowledge. It's just inference. Okay? And notice how important it is that the analog of what was the quantum vacuum states in quantum theory, here is just a state of knowledge as any other. And so it can carry information. In particular, it can carry information of the local phase. And um, so in summary, uh, the toy field theory reproduces the trap phenomenology of uh, quantum interference while explicitly rejects, rejecting all the interpretational claims associated with it. We can run a similar analysis also for uh, some related uh, phenomena like Elliott Subvide Van Bomb Tester, Wheeler Delay Choice, Quantum Eraser. You can look at them in the paper, but the, you know, the, the basic intuition is the same. Um, so this brings me to the conclusion of the first part. So the trap phenomenology of quantum interference does not capture the essence of quantum theory, where we have explicitly showed a model that, uh, that um, you know, reproduces this phenomenology but rejects all the claims. And I think there is a lesson attached to this uh, result, that uh, if you want to make claims about the non-classicality of quantum theory, you shouldn't just identify a feature that seems to be inherently mysterious, you have tried hard, uh, you're very smart. But no, all these kind of claims should be backed up by rigorous Nogo theorems, where you make a formal and pr uh, rigorous mathematical um, definition of uh, of, of your notion of classicality, and then you prove a Nogo theorem that shows a contradiction between this notion and the phenomenology under examination. And the successful at attempts of doing that, as you know, are like Bell's theorem, Koch and Specker theorem, and even more recent Nogo theorems. And look, like now you see, uh, there is a project to undergo uh, also in this context of uh, quantum interference, because so far we have just shown that the trap phenomenology of quantum interference does not pose a challenge to the classical worldview. But maybe there are some more nuanced aspects of quantum interference for which we can actually find this Nogo theorem, for which we can really say that the state a departure from the classical worldview. And this is exactly what I'm going to do now. Uh, but before I move to the second part, I maybe we can uh, ask a couple of questions and, I don't know, so post a bit. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Oh, 
what, what's that? Uh, Yeah, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with that time, sorry. My question differently. So, the phenomenology you described, could, uh, would it work with a coherent state? So, if I were to send uh, a laser light in the first bin filter, I would change the space, and then I would see the, the, um, the phenomenology you, you described. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Um, because actually, these very simple scenarios we consider, if you change them sli slightly, uh, for example, you change, imagine like the states you consider, you could uh, just uh, prepare them, just putting, I don't know, another beam splitter before, for example, which is not 50 50 because you can choose whatever state you want. In those cases, no, you fail to reproduce the, uh, the phenomenology with the, the filter exactly because this epistemic restriction is very symmetric and so only really applies to this uh, very specific cases. Uh, so you cannot, you cannot really describe any, any state. Uh, but yeah, like in some particular scenarios, I guess you can. I, yeah, I was trying to think of, an, of another system, an existing system that reproduces the phenomenology uh, completely independent of your toy model. Yeah. And I, I was under the impression that you're describing, I mean, the, yeah, but then the, that's photons, how it's, that there, I mean, the particle-like thing doesn't really appear. I mean, I don't think it's necessary. Or, okay, yeah, I might just be wrong. Just because I'm not um, Let me also add to this that uh, even if you, you can reproduce the phenomenology, the point is that uh, the way you reproduce it, you know, and with, with the theory you are considering, does it support or not these interpretational claims? I think the, the theory is pretty, pretty explicit, explicit that uh, you are not forced by the phenomena to accept these claims. Uh, in your, in your uh, model, I don't know, maybe, maybe then no, you I will mean, still I say, I yeah. Think Yeah, and by the way, the, the toy theory, you can show that it's operation equivalent to, you know, the, uh, what is called Ga Gaussian quantum mechanics, or in the discrete case of the stabilizer theory, at least for the old dimensional case. So maybe we're talking about the same things. Yes? More for clarification, like you, you model how to connect to each frequency point. So it's the same model, but in the original toy model, like uh, basically the ontology is uh, the one of particles. Mostly you think about position and momentum as the complementary variables. Here instead you really have two field modes. It's, that's why it's also called toy field theory. And there are, yeah. Um, then there are some other difference about, um, yeah, how to have like a second quantized description or first quantized description analog in the toy field theory. And going to these field modes is really enlightening in what it says. Uh, yeah, we can go into that later, otherwise it would take me a bit long to describe it. Yeah, can I go to the second part, then we can, yeah, we can discuss some things. Okay, good, so the second part, the title I put is, what aspects of the phenomenology of interference witness non-classicality? And in particular here is gonna be, what aspects of the phenomenology witness contextuality? Okay, this is the notion of non-classicality we're gonna consider, the generalized notion of contextuality. And the outline of the second part is the following. So I'm gonna start describing what is this more nuanced aspect of interference phenomenology that we consider, and the main character is gonna be this wave-particle duality relations, okay? I'm gonna define them, then basically these are just trade-off between a particle-like property and a wave-like property that are path distinguishability and visibility, and um, there, there is a particular trade-off that uh, uh, you know, is present in quantum theory. Then I'm gonna show that these wave particularity relations are just instances of uncertainty relations. 
And the reason why I do that is because then I'm going to use another result that we found that uh, as, you know, like, uh, connects uncertainty relations and uh, contextuality. So I'm going to conclude by saying that it is the functional form of wave particle duality relations that can witness contextuality, can witness non-classicality. OK? Good. So let me start now by describing wave particle duality relations. So these, as I said, are trade-off relations between the fringe visibility and the path distinguishability. So I'm going to de define first the visibility, then the distinguishability. And then I'm going to tell you what are these um, wave particle duality relations. So fringe visibility, you know, every time you have a, an interference experiment, if you have the interference pattern, the fringe visibility is just defined as the normalized difference between the maximum and minimum intensities. So imagine you send a water wave or wave, you know, like the, the, the double slit experiment, you have your interference pattern, you do this difference between maximum and minimum intensities. And uh, in the case that we're interested in, like the, the kind of interference in quantum theory, actually these intensities are proportional to the probability of detection. So imagine that you run the two-slit experiment, you send the photons, you, you see in all the location of the screen where the photon went, so you collect all these uh, frequencies, and then you can just say, oh, for each location I can talk about what is the probability of getting the photon there. And so this is going to be proportional to the intensity. That's why we can just uh, you know, uh, replace the intensities with probabilities. And if we go now to the, our beloved case of the max under interferometer where the locations are just two, left and right, we know that the, the, the denominator, uh, p max plus p is mean, is just one because probabilities are normalized. And so the visibility really becomes just the difference between the maximum probability of detection and the minimum probability of detection. So now I want to give you an expression of visibility in quantum mechanical terms, OK? In order to do that, I wanted to move from what was the second quantized description to a first quantized description. What does it mean? So let me recall that before we were, we were using this Fox space formalism. But actually, what we were considering was just a subspace of the total Fox space, because we were only considering the, you know, the cases spanned by these two states, 0, 1, and 1, 0. We never considered the cases 0, 0, or 1, 1, where you either you know, like, uh, uh, erase a, a, a photon or you create one. Um, but, but you see, like, this really uh, spans the, the state space of a qubit. So we could actually associate these two states in this first quantized description with the eigenstate of the Pauli z, for example, where you know, being in the eigenstate 0 means that the photon is on the right path. Being in the state 1 means the photon is on the left path. It would give an equivalent uh, description. And in particular, now we will have that the Pauli z corresponds to do a which way measurement. Okay? So for example, uh, which output port the photon goes corresponds to just performing a Pauli z. Okay? So all what I'm saying is, there is that we can associate our max zender interferometer with an effective qubit. You can call it the interferometer qubit, if you want. Okay? Of course, you can do the same if you consider the complementary basis. This would correspond to the eigenstate of the Pauli x. Okay? So this would be like the which phase measurement uh, as opposed to the which way measurement of the Pauli z. And then we can also say what uh, is the corresponding of the unitary of the beam splitter. Before was this entangling gate. In this first quantized description, it's just the Adamar gate, the mass from x to z. And you remember, like, the visibility was defined as the difference between maximum probability and minimum probability here. In this case, we did the difference between uh, the probability of detecting, uh, I don't know, plus one outcome of, of z, uh, minus the probability of getting plus, uh, minus uh, one outcome of z for the final state. But because the beam splitter is defined by the Hadamard, we can also imagine we consider the state inside the 50-50, inside the max under interferometer, and consider instead the, the x uh, probabilities for that state. You know? We can always do that. And uh, in particular, we can now give an expression for the visibility in terms of the Pauli x, because that's the which phase measurement, right? And the visibility uh, represents a, a wave property. And this is going to just be the maximum probability minus the minimum probability of uh, where the probabilities are of Pauli x obtaining plus 1 or minus 1 against state of Pauli x for the state inside the max zender interferometer. And this, in the end, is nothing but the expectation value of the Pauli x. So the expectation value of the which phase measurement. That's what the visibility in our case, OK? Just that. As you can imagine, for the path distinguishability, we can define it as you know, the probability of uh, 
uh, obtaining the photon on the left or obtaining the photon on the right or vice versa, depending on which one is the maximum. And this case is going to be associated with the probability of the Pauli Z for the state inside the max under interferometer. Uh, guess what? This is nothing but the expectation value in modulus of the Pauli Z. Okay? So basically, we have just seen that the visibility and distinguishability are nothing but the expectation values of the which phase and which way measurements. And these expectation values are nothing but the which phase and which way predictabilities. Okay? This, of course, range between 0 and 1. And imagine just what are the extreme cases. So when we have, for example, full wave uh, like behavior, so you remember every time we output in only one of the two ports. This would be the case where we have visibility 1 and distinguishability 0. So we don't know where the photon is. And uh, so it means that the distinguishability is 0. Um, but we know perfectly like the which phase information. And opposite, where we have a particle-like behavior, we do would have that the distinguishability is 1. So we know exactly where the photon goes. But we are completely ignorant about the which phase information. And so the visibility is 0. So it was known for a long time, actually 1988, and this was already built, this Greenberg and Yassin, on a paper even before from Zurek and Wouters, that there is a trade-off relation between uh, visibility and distinguishability, which is the following. Visibility square plus distinguishability square less or equal than 1. And this is the wave-particle duality relation in quantum theory. Okay? And look, like, uh, I want to make a point. It's true. Like, in quantum theory, there is this trade-off relation. But this is not something unique to quantum theory. Already in our toy field theory before, there was a the trade-off relation between particle-like and wave-like behavior. And it was exactly about this extreme case. So we have this wave-like behavior that was associated with having visibility 1 and distinguishability 0. And then we have this particle-like behavior we was indeed associated with having the opposite, so visibility 0 and distinguishability 1. Okay? So it's not the mere existence of uh, this wave-particle duality relations that is uh, an instance of non-classicality. Okay? So now uh, what I'm going to show is that wave-particle duality relations are just an example of uncertainty relations. So I'm going to now spend a couple of slides on uncertainty relations. I'm pretty sure that when I say uncertainty relations, the first thing you think about is Heisenberg-Robertson uncertainty relations. But these are not the uncertainty relations we consider. So let me also say why. So these are the, uh, you know, the famous Heisenberg-Robertson uncertainty relations. So basically, again, these are like a trade-off about the joint predictability of two observables for a given state. And in this case, the, our observables are A and B. We quantify the uh, uncertainties as the variances of these two observables. And then the relation just connects them with the expectation value of the commutator between them. Okay? But look, for example, these are not always satisfying these uh, uncertainty relations. Imagine the case where uh, A and B are Pauli x and Pauli z, like in our case. If you now consider that you compute these variances and this uh, commutator with respect to an eigenstate of x or of z, then you can easily check that the right hand side is zero. So it gives a, like a trivial bound, even if actually x and z, uh, they have a trade-off. Okay? So sometimes these are not satisfying because they can be trivial. Okay? And uh, there is an easy way to solve this problem, so to improve what are uncertainty relations, which is instead of considering these product uncertainty relations, just consider sum of uncertainties. Okay? And this is what we are going to do here. In particular, if we still consider the Pauli x and Pauli z measurements, you can easily find, just from the uh, shape of the block sphere, that uh, uh, you have this kind of relation between the variances. You literally write what are the uh, block vectors for, uh, you know, uh, for any state in terms of x and z coordinates. You can find the variances from them, and you easily find this relation. Okay? And what is interesting is that you can map, you, know, you can translate the uh, variances, you can write them in terms of the expectation values. So actually, you can have an uncertainty relations, which again is just a bound on the trade off between the x and z predictabilities in terms of expectation values. Okay? And these are the uncertainty relations we're going to consider. And uh, as you can imagine, as we saw before, in the case of uh, an interferometric qubit of the max ender interferometers, these are nothing but our. Uh, um, wave particle duality uncertainty relations. You remember, V was the uh, which phase predictability, and it was indeed the expectation value of x. D was the which way uh, 
distinguishability and the predictability, and it was related to the uh, expectation value of Pauli Z. Okay, so these are just instances of uncertainty relations in the case of the interferometric qubit of the Max Ender interferometer. Why did I do this? Because now I'm going to show how we can relate uncertainty relations and uh, contextuality. And this is really the last bit of the talk. In order to do that, of course, I need to first define what is uh, generalized non-contextuality. Pretty sure many people here know that, but let me go through it. So I need to you know, uh, introduce the framework of operational theories and ontological models. In particular, here we're going to consider operational theories in a prepare and measure scenario. And in this scenario, an operational theory just stipulates what are the preparations, the measurements, and they provide an algorithm to compute the probability of an outcome given preparation and measurements. So the operational theory is just a tool to predict these statistics given preparation and measurements. In particular, for the results to follow, we're going to associate preparations with, uh, we're going to give a real vector representation of them so you can just list all the probabilities of outcomes for the preparation given all the measurements. So have, have these vectors. And then you're going to find out that you can write the, the statistics just in terms of the inner product between them. It's just a technical part. At this point, you know, you have your operational theory in general. It predicts very well what's going on if you go to the lab. And then you might think, look, there must be a reason why it predicts well, right? So I want to endow my operational theory not just with this predictive power, but also with an explanatory power. And this is what uh, you know, an ontological model of an operational theory tries to do. It wants to say that actually, you know, there is a, a physical system that uh, you know, undergoes all these preparations and measurements that we do. And the physical system has some you know, like properties that they exist even if I don't perform the experiment. Okay? And I want to define these elements. In particular, in the ontological model framework, to which system we associate a non state space that describes the possible physical states or ontic states. And these are the properties we want to capture about uh, our system. These are really the elements of reality. And in particular, the ontological model framework associates with uh, each preparation a probability distribution in this ontic space, which is just a measurable space. Associates also a probability distribution to the measurement elements. And the way it reproduces the statistics is through the uh, law of classical total probability. Again, you can give a vectorial representation of this, and uh, you can just be consistent and find the uh, same story, okay? the statistics in this way. Good, at this point, we are about ready to define what is a non-contextual ontological model of an operational theory. In particular, we're going to focus, as you see, on preparations, but you can define it for measurements and transformations as well. Um, but before doing that, I need to define what, uh, what it means for, to have like operation equivalent preparations. So we say that two preparations uh, in the theory are operationally equivalent if there is no way to distinguish them. There don't exist any measurement for which we can see difference in their statistics. Okay? And uh, what the assumption now of uh, non-contextuality requires is that and preparation on contextual ontological model wants that these operational equivalences are preserved in the ontological model, so at the level of the distributions, at the level of the way we represent these uh, preparations in the ontological model. So basically, this is, has been motivated as an instance of a methodological principle inspired by Leibniz to say that, you know, if every time you see two things to be the same, then they must be the same thing at the level of the reality. Not going to go into, the, into all these credentials. I just wanted to say that, OK, we're going to use this instance of preparation on contextuality, so where we consider convex mixtures of uh, preparations, and we demand them to be the same at the ontological level. And let me say that uh, contextuality is one of the leading notions of uh, non-classicality. And in particular, about quantum theory, it can show that it's impossible to have a preparation non-contextual model which is consistent with the statistics of quantum theory. You can prove it already for one qubit only. Okay? Good. Now we know what are uncertainty relations. We know preparation non-contextuality. Uh, we want to connect them. But you see, like, there is an immediate challenge to do that. Because if you remember, uncertainty relations are trade-off relations between the joint predictability of two observables for a given state. Okay? Instead, the contextuality is not about a state. You know, actually, you can show that uh, at least you need uh, four states 
and two tomography complete measurements to have a proof of preparation contextuality. Why? Because you need to have operational equivalences to talk about contextuality. So how do we overcome this problem? The solution is that we're going to consider only states in our theories that satisfy a particular symmetry condition. In particular, the symmetry condition, uh, yes, oh here, sorry, just what I said. So uncertainty relation, single state, contextuality requires at least four states. And uh, so the way we overcome this is that um, we're going to consider uncertainty relations so, so for only for theories that satisfy what we call this A12 symmetry. So now I'm going to describe what is this symmetry, and then I'm going to uh, state the result. So what is this A12 symmetry condition? An operational theory satisfies A12 symmetry condition is for every state of the theory these two conditions hold. So the first thing is that every state we consider has equal predictability counterparts. What does it mean? It means that if you take a state, it has a X predictability and a Z predictability. In our theory, we want that there exist other states that have the same predictabilities. Okay? And so why do I say that? Because if in my theory there are <laughs> these other states with the same predictabilities, then the uncertainty relations about them are going to be the same. Okay? So I can consider all of these states if I need to just assess a property of one uncertainty relation. And we're going to consider only theories where we have uh, this amount of states. Second, because we want to connect uncertainty relations with contextuality, we're going to assume that among these uh, states that have the same predictabilities, we also can find operational equivalences. OK? So these two assumptions, we need to connect uncertainty relations and contextuality. This might sound a bit abstract, so let us see how how quantum theory satisfies these two assumptions. In particular, let's consider our qubit. Imagine that we start that we have our state, which is S1. Okay? S1 is going to have some x predictability and z predictability. And notice that these in the block sphere are just related to the projection onto the x and z uh, axis. So it's quite simple to picture what is the x and z predictability of a state. And then you see all the states in this red uh, plane they all have in modulus the same, in absolute value, the same x and z predictabilities. You can just picture that if you take the projection on x and z, they're all the same in uh, absolute value. And moreover, if you start from S1, you see that you have other four states that not only have the same predictabilities, but also they satisfy an operational equivalence. In particular, if you mix x, S1 and S3, this is equal of mixing S2 and S4. So the qubit theory satisfies this, and it satisfies it for every state. The reason why it's called A12 symmetry is because if you see, like, this condition imposes that uh, you need to consider uh, four states that uh, basically you can find them by the action of the symmetry group of the reflections of the rectangle that is called the A12 Coxeter group. I just uh, some a technical aspect. You can just imagine this to be this rectangle condition if you want. Okay? So maybe this was the most technical slide. I mean, if you didn't get it, uh, no problem. But I really needed to define it because now the result depends on this symmetry property. In particular, what we show is that if you take an operational theory that has this A12 symmetry, then if the operational theory admits of a non contextual ontological model, then the uncertainty relation is bounded. Uh, to be of this linear form, OK? So x plus z plus x less or equal than 1. So non-contextuality bounds the kind of trade-off you can have between x and z predictabilities. And you remember, instead of quantum theory, it was z squared plus x squared less or equal than 1. So it's the functional form of the uncertainty relations that can or cannot witness contextuality. And of course, we can now just uh, uh, sorry, we can now just uh, state the same for the way particle duality relations. We can say that an operational theory having this symmetry, A12 symmetry, if it admits of a non contextual model, then the, uh, uncertain, the way particle duality relation is bounded in this way V plus D less or equal than 1. I'm not going to provide the proof of this, it's, it's not difficult, it just uh, takes a lot of time, but it's just algebraic picture. Um, Proof. You can find it in the paper. And this result is quite neat. Look, you just can see it in a plot. You know, like if you plot the z and x uh, predictabilities, you really see that uh, 
the, the, here the, the, the red line corresponds to the non-contextual bound. And you see that instead in quantum theory you can do better. So you can jointly predict better X and Z uh, predictabilities than uh, in non-classical theories when you consider this A1-2 symmetry. Of course, you can also do the plot for the, I don't know why it doesn't show, yeah, for the wave particle duality relations. So let me conclude the second part by saying that we have seen that wave particle duality relations are uncertainty relations. And it is the functional form of the uncertainty relations uh, for theories that satisfy this symmetry that witness contextuality. It's not the mere existence of uh, wave particle duality relations that is a notion of non classicality, but it's the functional form that uh, they take. So let me conclude everything by saying that the, really the take home message is the following that the trap phenomenology of quantum interference does not capture the essence of quantum theory. But if you consider more nuanced aspects, in particular the functional form of the wave particle duality relations, then you can witness contextuality. So if you go to the lab, you perform your interference experiment. You also need to satisfy this uh, symmetry condition. You evaluate your fringe visibility. You evaluate your uh, which way distinguishability. If they violate the non-contextual bound, then you're witnessing uh, non-classicality in a quantum interference experiment. So with this, I conclude. I just leave you with some uh, references. And uh, yeah, thanks for the attention. Uh, that's the German way. No, I wouldn't. So, um, yeah, I, I can say something more about this. Um, so in the case of X, Z uncertainty relations, actually just changing the phase does not help because it just would allow you to go to the Y, but it, this wouldn't change, for example, the difference between the, yeah, you would still be able to develop models that you are within the non-contextual uh, mm -hmm. bound. But if you could, I didn't say it, you know, just because of length, you can, redefine all these results in terms of X, Y, Z, okay? And in that case, like the changing the phase would help. But for sure, changing the, the beam splitter, uh, sorry, the, yeah, instead of 50-50 beam splitter, choosing a different uh, reflectivity would also not allow you to reproduce this in the right, right. field theory. Yeah, yeah, I think you can do it to some extent. Um, then I, I'm not sure that, uh, but, but then I'm not sure, because also look, like the, sort of the, the toy theory is that it reproduces a bunch of phenomena that were considered to be just quantum. And um, just by, and, 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 I mean, the nice part is that you do it in a very, uh, you know, like, uh, let's say, simple way, like uh, you just say that, uh, oh, maybe, you know, the world of quantum theory is not that strange, it's just that there is this very symmetric, uh, you know, epistemic restriction tells you that you, at maximum you can know uh, the same amount that you cannot know, like uh, it's very symmetric. If you do a very strange epistemic restriction, I don't know what you would gain in terms of, uh, from an interpretational point of view. But sure, I mean, you can develop a very sophisticated one and uh, maybe get more examples of this. But I guess if you wanna get all of them, then, uh, yeah, you will get a very, very weird uh, epistemic, ontolog psi epistemic ontological model, and I don't think there is a point in doing that because that wouldn't help your interpretation of quantum theory. Right, right, so here actually what is classical and classical are very precise form, so what we believe to be classical, classical is um, a theory where uh, when you define the kinematics and dynamics, this is always 
made of like sets for the kinematics and function for the dynamics because this is like uh, how classical theory is done. And actually, you can uh, write, uh, I didn't, but you can write all the toy theory just in the symplectic, um, uh, you know, in terms of symplectic structure, symplectic formalism, exactly like uh, you have a phase space, like this is exactly uh, classical Hamiltonian mechanics and uh, Liouville mechanics. Then you can say, I mean, the epistemic restriction uh, is strange, right? Why, why should I believe in the epistemic restriction? Well, I would say that uh, this, uh, I mean, if we could explain all quantum theory just with the epistemic restriction, let's say that we live in a world that actually works with the, like the, the toy model, I think that we would have uh, way less problems, for example, than try to interpret uh, Bell's theorem, you know, where there are uh, way more serious uh, interpretational problems with that, all this like relational Leibniz's principle or no fine tuning. And, um, and yeah, I think like a, like a quantum foundationalist, a, a, toy field, a toy theory foundational researcher in that uh, world would actually need to try to justify why the epistemic restriction. But for example, you can imagine that it comes from, I don't know, thermodynamic reasons, you know, you cannot know everything. Or, uh, so in that case, it wouldn't be interpretationally problematic. I think it really, uh, yeah, there is a, you know, like a, a degree of how, how non-classical is an epistemic restriction with respect, for example, of the mysteries of Bell's theorem or cohen specker theorem. But yeah, uh, for you it's, uh, I take it. Let me ask one question myself. So in the beginning there was still a little gap. We were brushing over the uncertainty relations versus the interrogative. Yeah. So I wonder in particular what motivates these operational equivalences that you that you assume in the A1 through symmetry when when you have this interrogative? Is it is it somehow a claim that there are no I don't know, hidden degrees of freedom that you couldn't assess? Uh so, so I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but um, also when you do the interferometer, you need to be sure that uh, the states you are preparing like satisfy this. So you need to also construct these other f three states that uh, have the same like uh, visibility and distinguishability, because otherwise you wouldn't satisfy those conditions. And I mean, without those, you cannot connect contextuality and uh, wave particle duality relations because you wouldn't have operational equivalences. So you need to, yeah, you need to check the operational equivalences. Is this, was this a question or? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Correct. Yes, correct. Yeah, you assume that. So you you would have the same problems that you have in contextuality experiments, tomographic completeness, and then you need to run the yeah tomographic agnostic uh, procedure or yeah like all, all these things. So same same exactly same story, just in an interferometer um, scenario. Actually, you may remind that I started saying what is classical in our notion. I just said the kinematics and dynamics are sets and functions, but I didn't say the main property, which is this uh, uh, no fine tuning or Leibnizianity, which is, for example, this non contextuality I says. This is a requirement that uh, the toy field theory satisfies, and for example, quantum theory doesn't, you know. That's really what means in our terms to be classical, okay? So that you assume that you have this thing that if in principle there are two scenarios that are operationally indistinguishable, in your model of reality they are the same, okay? So this, this property here uh, is, a very, is what defines classicality, okay, in our terms. And the pre preparation on contextuality is just an instance of that. But in Bell's theorem, cohen specker theorem and so on, you violate these uh, no fine tuning assumptions. And those are very non-classical. No, and way more non-classical than just postulating an epistemic restriction, in my view. Yeah, so actually, I know nothing about non-contextuality. I don't know what it really means. But what you just said is that quantum theory, uh, although depending, I mean, although you could, I mean, if you measure something, depending on the preparation, I mean, you can have different states or uh, different, I mean, you, oh, gosh. <laughs> I tell you what <laughs> you, you want to say. Then. Yeah. 
not to the measure, but like uh, think uh, think for example at the completely mixed state of a qubit. You know, you can uh, okay. you you can prepare it. You can prepare it as a mixture of plus one, as plus minus, or with zero, mixtures of uh, zero ones, right? Yeah, so basically what the fact that quantum theory uh, is contextual tells you that in any ontological model, these two things are different. Even if at operational level, I can never distinguish them. And you see, this sounds very conspiratorial. That sounds very non-classical to me. And those are the, you know, the conclusions from Bell's theorem and Cohen-Specker's theorem and so on. And these are way more mysterious than postulating an epistemic restriction, uh, supersymmetric, like uh, knowledge balance principle. I mean, that's, uh, that's, I think, the distinction between uh, weak non-classicality and strong non-classicality, in my view. And, and uh, you know, Bell's theorem and so are the things to explain. Uh, Thank you. that if with epistemic restriction that are, I don't know, natural somehow, we could really 